Okay, um, you don't have to judge me for the late notice or anything like that, but yeah, you're welcome to try. Um, so, uh, again, the, the title for my talk is a, a mixtape for scaling software testing. I think what's nice about this talk is that almost everybody today has mentioned something in my talk. So, uh, you might have heard of a, a lot of these, uh, these uh, things I'm going to speak about, but uh, we're going into a little bit more depth. I'll try and do the live demo. Apparently, that makes me awesome and tough. So, we'll do that. Um, listen to a little music, um, and uh, first let's start with a little talk about me. Um, who's this Abe Lincoln looking dude? That's me. Uh, I'm, my name is Patrick Turley again. I work for a company called ThoughtWorks. How many people in the room uh, have heard of ThoughtWorks before the coffee thing? Uh, cool. How many people, of those people, how many know what we do? Slightly less percentage. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, we, 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 we're software testers, right? No. Um, so uh, ThoughtWorks is a, is a, is a consultancy. Uh, what we do is we, we go and help uh, big, big and small businesses uh, with all sorts of different things, um, mostly related to technology. We, are, uh, we, ha we have some of the technological specialists out there in the world that write the books. Uh, mostly noted is, is probably Martin Fowler. He works for us uh, as well. Um, but we, we do a variety of different things, and, and we are very technology agnostic. Uh, so what you're going to see here today is we're going to talk mostly about things that I think apply pretty well across the board. They don't necessarily uh, need to work in PHP or uh, you know, .NET or you know, uh, Python, you name it. I'm going to go across the spectrum a little bit and try and talk, uh, talk about a whole bunch of different things. Um, we'll see if we can get that job done. Um, somebody once told me that I had to put a sort of an agenda slide on everything I, I, every talk I give. So I tried to do that, but it's kind of weak. Um, and so what we're going to be talking about is, is uh, scaling the, the quality aspect of software systems, not necessarily uh, scaling uh, deployments or, uh, or scaling you know, user access and things like that. Uh, I thought that was pretty well covered in the, in the other talks that came, and I think those guys did a fantastic job. Thank you very much. Um, but we'll talk about, about testing and, and all, the, all the different uh, things that relate to that. And we'll talk about a lot about uh, some music. Um, so one thing I kind of neglected on the previous slide is that uh, in a previous life, I was a, I was a radio DJ. And uh, so I, I used to run a radio station in the middle of a uh, small town in Missouri, uh, in the middle of the dead center of the United States, pretty much nowheresville. Uh, we don't have beaches and stuff like you guys have here in Cape Town. Um, and so uh, I think the a core thing to who I am is really about, about music and, and, and it's how I relate to all sorts of different types of topics, uh, most notably technology. But, uh, but yeah, during day to day, I do spend my days coding. So uh, we'll talk about that uh, and kind of rock through it. By the way, these guys are the, the crash test dummies. Uh, anybody know the most famous song that these guys came out with? Yeah, you did. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, that was them. Um, but I thought it was cool because they, you would never recognize it from that picture. I thought that was fun. Um, cool, so let's get on with it. First off, uh, what's a mixtape? Uh, how many people here in the room are old enough to know what a mixtape actually is? Yeah. Woo. Geezers. Um, cool. Good for you guys. Uh, so uh, the, the quick definition coming out of Wikipedia is that you know, it, it's, a, uh, it's a group of uh, music that uh, reflects the musical um, tastes of the compiler. And it's a, uh, it's a range of casually selected things, uh, songs that uh, have a conceptual mix that are linked to a theme, theme in this particular case, or a mood, uh, and a highly personalized statement uh, tailored to the tape's intended recipient, you guys. Uh, so I, I did the best I could, uh, like you said, on short notice, but we won't use that as an excuse, uh, to put together kind of uh, a mixed tape uh, relating to this story that I want to tell about how I believe uh, the standard trajectory goes for scaling the testing on a uh, software project. Cool. So let's start out. Okay. So the first song is uh, called "I'm the One." It's by the Descendants. I can shout over it. Um, it's a punk rock tune, right? It's, uh, it's it's pretty fast. I think the song is in total maybe a minute and a half long. Uh, you guys will. I, I nearly played the entirety of it, by the way. Uh, that's the, Descend the Descendants. They're some of the oldest punk rock bands around. Um, and this kind of represented very well for me the way almost every single software project starts, uh, which is, I'm the one. I, I do all of the testing. Uh, you, I'm the one you're going to rely on. I'm the one that uh, takes care of functionally clicking through the app. I'm going to go ahead and you know, uh, make, make sure all my little units work just fine. I'm going to do everything manually. And so that's, that's how almost every software project starts. 
You can, you can probably talk to people who uh, start with a big test suite because they've been working in the industry for a long time. They start, you know, uh, they have a whole bunch of different pieces to test this thing because they have some experience. But I think it's safe to say that when we're talking about scale, scaling things, we should start with the smallest thing possible. Uh, one of the things, uh, I forget who it was, uh, they mentioned scale, scaling something is not only about scaling to as high as possible, but also the low end as well. So if you have uh, something that's three lines of code and it's not getting bigger than that and no one ever cares, just freaking manually test it, man. I mean, it's, it's quite simple. The, by the way, the rest of the people at ThoughtWorks are going to fire me for having said that to you guys. Um, it's really not what we do. <laughs> but um, so, so that's the beginnings, uh, and I think that's, I think that's just fine. And I think it's, uh, sometimes at these conferences, it's important for somebody to step up and say, you know what, um, for little, uh, little jobs, don't do massive things. Do, do a little uh, easy to go thing and start off from there. Cool, the next song in the mixtape is a song called From Little uh, Things, Big Things Grow. Um, it's a folk tune, uh, kind of verse. But what this, thing, what, what this song really represents to me is about getting to the first step of automated testing. So we're going to talk a lot about different ways to automate things and how that grows. But the beginning step is finding a little bit, a little something to, to automate a test. How many people in the room uh, would say that they uh, have an active practice in their company of writing unit tests on a regular basis? So the, what do we call it, two thirds? Uh, that's pretty stinking good. Uh, that's, uh, let, me, let me tell you guys, this is not the common thing in the industry. Okay? There are a lot of people out there writing a lot of software that stay at I'm the one. Okay? So uh, I, think it's, I think it's really good that we've kind of collected a lot of people who, who share that similar idea. And I think it says something really good for the area that we, that we, we have that kind of good thing going. But uh, I would say the, that the first thing you're probably going to do is you're going to write some unit tests. The lowest level uh, of functions that you guys have, you're going to start with, uh, with some automated testing that hits those things and, and, and does very, very white box testing. And you guys, uh, at least approximately two thirds of you guys, are used to this uh, standard everyday business. Uh, another quick survey, I'm going to just keep doing the survey thing because it's late in the day. You guys want to go drink beers and, and I'm going to just keep going with that so that you guys stay awake and pay attention to me. Um, but how many of you guys are actually doing uh, test-driven development on top of that unit testing practice? A significantly less, uh, smaller portion. I think that's, uh, that's remarkable. Um, but uh, one of the things that people see is, is, is that beginning of writing unit tests, uh, starting out with something that, uh, that just verifies what they've done, they find that the next uh, uh, logical practice to take on uh, would be the, the test-driven development practice. Uh, making sure that you um, well, I won't go into the, my whole TDD talk. I can go over and over again on that. But um, lots and lots of benefits there. Uh, I think you guys should, you might want to roll with it. Next song. Um, this is called She's Automatic. It's by, the, by Rancid, another punk rock tune. You can't tell I'm kind of a punk rock guy. Um, but Rancid, uh, first off, they're one of the original uh, uh, LA punk rock bands. They, uh, very aggressive music, um, and I think it's for, for a uh, really good topic. Um, I wanted to talk about taking that, uh, that uh, extra kind of functional verification, the sort of clicking through the app sort of stuff, uh, and automating that. I think that's, that's a step that, uh, yet again, another group of people probably don't get to. So I was talking about TDD, uh, and again, how many people in the room are, use some sort of functional automation tool? Excellent. Good for you guys. Um, the two I'll bring up very, very, very briefly are, uh, are water and selenium. Um, very, very similar concepts. They're both built on the, on the web driver technology. Um, these, the idea for this in terms of uh, web automation, and again, if you guys are making standalone apps or uh, say um, mobile apps, things like that, uh, there are other options that we can talk about. Um, it's just that I tend to f focus on this space the most. But um, the idea is just, is just to automate the click through of, uh, of your application, uh, some high-level workflows, and uh, stop doing all the clicking yourself. Um, it's quite painful to do all that, and at the end of the day, I think uh, if you do that manually, you're probably going to be spending all your time clicking in that app if you're actually trying to maintain uh, an application of high quality. Um, the other thing that I, I'm, I, I does anybody consider them themselves a QA in, in the room? Okay, this is, one, this is one thing I wanted to say. I, I, I get a no from that, by the way, zero. 
I think it's, it's kind of disappointing. Um, I think that uh, our industry may not take care of the, the QA profession uh, super well, so I kind of encourage you guys to go back to your companies. If you do have a QA uh, uh, kind of or, a group in your organization, to uh, tell them how much you should respect them, because this is something that I think if we do this correctly, uh, there's absolutely no way that a QA organization can get by doing manual testing these days. Uh, applications are too large uh, and they're too complex uh, to be able to actually physically click through things. So tools like Selenium, tools like Water, and by the way, they're just, they're, at the end of the day, they're just basic APIs to click through, uh, fill in text in, in, inside your browser. Uh, these things are, are what transition us from uh, having a bunch of uh, brainless monkeys clicking through our application to getting to a state where we actually have people thinking about how to adjust for quality of our applications. So uh, I think uh, what was really interesting about a, a number of the talks is kind of talking about how they monitor and look at quality from a bunch of different perspectives. I'm probably not going to get to all of those different things, things like performance and, and, and all the scalability concerns that we, we have. Um, those are, are very, very challenging uh, to, to automate. So we at least, at very minimum, need to start automating the simple things, the things that we have tried and tested tr tools to do. I'm not saying there's not some tools to do performance testing and all the other scalability things. I just think that uh, at a base level we need to start with the, the automation tools. So uh, let's crank on with the, uh, with the, uh, the mixtape. So the next song is uh, Englishman in New York. Um, this is by Sting. Uh, so it seems like uh, when, some, when you're growing an application or growing a, 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 a really a piece of your business, um, oh, I forget this thing. I forget this thing. Cool. Um, but as you're growing uh, a, a piece of your business, uh, even if you're uh, coming from the startup community, which is, I think, uh, the majority of what I'm trying to talk to, uh, you're going to come to a point where you, you need to interact with people who don't, aren't necessarily programmers. Um, I think a lot of businesses have done pretty well trying to avoid that, but at some, at some stage, uh, you're going to have to talk to somebody who doesn't speak Ruby or something like that. And so uh, at, at the end of the day, I think we need to start speaking English to one another, and we, we can focus that in on our testing. Uh, and the basics, I mean, it, uh, you guys have probably seen these things, but uh, the basics is the Gherkin style syntax, um, the sort of uh, English uh, written test that, uh, that actually translates to execu executable code. Um, how, many people, how many people use Cucumber or some Gherkin-like syntax in, in their apps? Five or six? I think this one's interesting. I, I kind of want to talk about this in terms of a, a testing technique. Um, the, the interesting thing about the, about the, the Gherkin syntax is I think it, 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 there's quite a bit of overhead to do this. It's not easy to map English to, to code. Um, it's a fairly tricky process. And so uh, you're investing quite a lot of time and effort into, uh, into making this work out. And so uh, I think you need to know, uh, know the goals. And so the goals for doing something like this, like I said, is you're, you're trying to communicate with somebody who doesn't necessarily speak developer. Um, and and that's, that's a tricky process. Um, I think if you, if, you, if you write things in the Gherkin style syntax, uh, you're never really going to get to a point where, uh, where you're getting value out of it if you're not sharing that with other people inside your organization. Uh, and making that available. Um, so, so definitely do that. A uh, quick overview of how Gherkin uh, kind of works and the, the BDD style kind of uh, idea came from. Um, but first off, you start with, a, with a, a feature. And so you name this thing, whatever you're trying to test. And it's a high level feature. Uh, this is the, so I, I gave this one just because ThoughtWorks was doing coffee. I thought that was cool. And so um, the feature is uh, serving coffee in order to earn money, which we're not. Um, customers should be able to buy coffee at all times. Okay, cool. Uh, so none of that is executable. Matter of fact, uh, the whole, whole discussion on that is, is all about the fact that it's not. Uh, this is actually pure English description. Um, and you can see how quickly uh, this style of description can replace a large percentage of the documentation that you generate on a project. You really, I mean, in, in a lot of organizations, I see this actually being the, the documentation, the, uh, the here's, here's a, a list of features, and they actually even write them somewhat similarly to this. Okay, after that, uh, things start to get a little bit more useful. Uh, then we can list out a number of scenarios. Uh, by the way, the, the whole scenario style of, of testing, um, I think a book uh, that I recommend is, uh, is um, Testing by Example. Um, it's a, it, they outline a lot, large percentage of this kind of stuff. So check that out. But, uh, but listing a series of scenarios that relate to that feature, 
Um, those scenarios start with a, a little text description. Again, uh, just pure English, no code there. Uh, and then after that, uh, it, the, you have a series of keywords that start lines uh, in, the, in the Gherkin processor. So the first line is it starts with a given. The, these things you can use to define uh, on, uh, in, the, in a series of step files to tell uh, the, the actual code base how this stuff can actually execute. Um, and probably, it's very likely that at the end of the day, uh, these, your uh, feature file here is probably going to be executed by something like Selenium or Water. Um, that's, that's, I, I find that to be very common. Some people actually uh, go a little further than that, but um, I think the, the standard most common thing is, is to see this happening and actually executing through uh, whatever your, your actual interface is. Um, and then, you know, given there are one coffees, uh, that pluralization is pretty bad, uh, there's, there's one coffee left in the machine, and I have deposited one dollar. Uh, when I press the coffee button, then I uh, should be served a coffee. I mean, this is basic uh, acceptance criteria type stuff. Uh, this, is, this is what we, how we expect the, the system to work. Um, I don't know. It, it, it depends on how, how, how things are working in your organization, but um, I'd say many organizations are moving to this sort of structure in terms of requirements anyways, uh, and uh, integrating the actual uh, acceptance criteria to code just seems to make perfectly good sense. Um, again, I, I stole this one from the Cucumber website. Forgive me. Next track. She's gonna break soon, gonna break soon, gonna break soon. She's gonna break soon. Cool, so less than Jake. Break soon, um, it's kind of a ska punk soon. band. Um, so I think it's freaking awesome. Uh, this song is, is off of one of the most recent albums. Uh, called called She's Gonna Break Soon. Um, it's kind of repetitive, like a lot of punk rock. It really drills the concept into your head. Uh, and I kind of like that for this talk. It's pretty awesome. Um, the idea here is that eventually, uh, along the path, you're not going to be able to live with the suites being uh, as coarse as we just discussed. Having just a unit test suite and just a functional test suite, um, and, and one just interacts fully with your browser or uh, front end of whatever sort, uh, and one purely executes white box uh, tests, I think there comes a, a point in which you're testing uh, the feedback loop is going to be uh, too, too long, right? And so most of the, most of the things that I'm going to suggest here, the, the agitator, the reason that you're going to take on some of these practices has everything to do with the pain that you feel when, when running your tests. Um, the point of writing all this stuff and putting out quite a lot of effort is to get fast feedback, right? So our goal is to make that tight loop of feedback um, uh, really, really fast. Uh, so if, if at any point in time, which will come very, very quickly, uh, you're, you're, writing you're writing unit tests, um, and just accessing your code at, at whatever level you want, um, that suite is going to become uh, too much of a burden to bear. I think uh, if, if, in many cases, if that, uh, if that test suite in its entirety doesn't run in, in a few minutes, um, y you really have lost, track, like, lost sight of the, of the goal. Because the goal of a, uh, of a test suite is that we want, uh, we want the developers to be able to, uh, to get the feedback pretty much every time they make a change. A lot of these guys are talking about, uh, about continuous delivery, which uh, I, of course, am an extreme advocate up for. Um, I thought the Etsy talk was fantastic, by the way, guys. Uh, and if you're going to do continuous delivery, they, everyone mentions it, uh, but I don't know if they put the, the right oomph on it and, and to say that you really can't deliver 40 times a day if you don't have some automated verification. And if that automated verification takes any more than 15 minutes, you, you just physically can't deploy 40 times a day. It's just not possible. And so I think, uh, I, I think at the end of the day, uh, all the rest of these techniques that I'm going to talk to you about are not about verification anymore, although that's absolutely essential. That's, but that's basically what the first half of this stuff is all about. Uh, now we're going to talk more about how to make sure that you can continue to maintain that same level of quality as your application code base scales out, and especially if you have that monolithic app, um, which I think is uh, extremely common in the industry, if I could say that. Um, but so the, the first recommendation here is that is to break out, uh, let's try breaking out your unit test suite, uh, for example. And many people, I think, when they write unit tests, they look at the at the amount of code that they're testing. And they think that, that that constitutes a unit. I think that um, I think that that just causes one one particular problem, which is that almost every application that I've been involved with, and almost every unit has had some interaction with something else. 
uh, be it the data, the database is probably the most likely thing, right? You're probably either going to read or write from a database. And at the end of the day, that call is not super taxing in the beginning. If, so we, we, we're, we're, we're starting out saying, yeah, um, my, my unit test runs in two milliseconds, right? Whatever. But if I had 10,000 unit tests, I can't wait that long. I'm getting to the point where it's, it's, getting, to, it's getting to be too much, right? 10 minutes. Uh, very quickly. I mean, you, you can get into minutes without, without having to go too far. And as soon as the database uh, grows and gets, becomes more complex, your units become a little bit slightly more complex, that becomes even more and more difficult. So I think the recommendation here is break that test suite out. Break it out into something that uh, very accurately tests just the, the functionality that exists that you're, that you're writing, the abstraction that you're adding on to the database. Um, start by doing that. Uh, and to do that, you're going to have to employ quite a lot of uh, mocking techniques. Um, so almost every, uh, every language that I know of uh, has some pretty excellent mocking library and usually quite a bit of patterns uh, out to, uh, to take care of the database and make sure that you're not hitting it. Um, as soon as you remove something like interaction with a database, interaction with anything that's not um, completely liquidly split, uh, you're going on uh, to making that suite significantly more useful, significantly more fast feedback. Um, that's not to say that there's not room for, of course, uh, integration testing, which, by the way, uh, I think uh, that, that term is used uh, kind of fluidly in the industry, and, not, uh, and we don't all share the, the same understanding of that. But I would say that having your code interact with the database is, is uh, integration. And so at, at, the, at a base level, you're integrating with some other piece of software. I, that's just the definition of the word. And so putting that into some additional integration suite, so for example, if you're building a basic CRUD app, uh, I would expect that your create action had some sort of integration test to make sure that you actually created something given some proper data. So that's the, that's the idea. Uh, and then you're going to use the, the unit suite, which should be much, much larger. I, I'm sure many people in the room have seen the sort of testing pyramid that you can Google for. It's out there. Uh, but the unit test being the base, uh, being the majority of your tests, uh, those are going to run in no time at all. Um, matter of fact, uh, many people, I was going to kind of leave it to later, many people actually run those as they're typing, not, not just uh, at the end or when they're going to commit. They run their entire unit test suite uh, while they're typing. And I think that's, that, that's an awesome stage to get to. Um, but I think at the, at the, uh, at the beginning, um, that's going to be perfectly fine until uh, a certain point. Okay, breaking, breaking the unit test suite apart, we talk about that. To talk about splitting out things like the database, uh, additional units, we can rock and roll through that, no problem. But I think, uh, I think there's also some merit to splitting out the, uh, the functional suite into, into different purposes. Now this one, this one is interesting because it's not as much about uh, the speediness and interactiveness of, of certain components, but I think your functional suite can often be broken out into things uh, for different purposes. Uh, things like uh, smoke, smoke tests, we, uh, somebody was mentioning the, the smoke tests that are run. Those, Those things uh, should be things that can be run in production even, uh, if you'd like. Basically the things that verify uh, that your application is up. That's, that's all, we, also all we're caring about there. Uh, and then into series uh, of more in-depth tests that give you uh, different types of feedback. The reason I talk about breaking those up is because of the, the next point. I think that's, uh, that's useful to know. <laughs> Well, so this band's called The Urge. Um, here's from my hometown. Uh, they're, uh, they're kind of a ska band. Again, sorry to start for the theme, you know, whatever. Um, but uh, they're a ska band from my hometown, uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And um, the, this song is, uh, is called Divide and Conquer. And really what we're talking about is now uh, we have all these different test suites. And I think we can, uh, I, was, I was assuming that everybody is, uh, is using a CI system. How many people in the room uh, use CI on a regular basis? half or so of the room. Um, so uh, assuming that you use some CI, let's talk about that. A um, bunch of different CI technologies out there. They, they all kind of are very similar. And given that ThoughtWorks produces one, don't tell anybody else at my office. Um, but yeah, they're, they're all very similar. They do the same, same concept. Um, basically, we're going to run our test suites, build, our, build any artifacts necessary. And if you go so far as to uh, hang out with the continuous delivery kids. You're probably going to have the, the mechanism to do the deployments and things like that integrated very, very tightly with, the, with this concept. Uh, maybe even uh, the buttons and stuff will be uh, built and kind of formally executed through uh, your CI pipelines. 
Um, but okay, so uh, the, the benefit for at least the, the five or so that are on the screen are that uh, having multiple build agents and running those, those types of things in parallel, at least when, uh, every time a commit happens, will additionally give you faster feedback. Um, it makes perfect sense. No need to, uh, if you're going to run all your tests for everything that you've got, no need to go ahead and run them sequentially. We can go ahead and take care of that. Uh, separate the suites out very, very easily into different steps inside of the continuous integration pipeline and, and build a proper pipeline. Okay? Uh, many people in, in the past, I think, saw continuous integration as one step. It builds, does the whole deed, uh, and, and is done. And I think these days, the more modern look at it is uh, there are a series of steps to get, get to the, the goal of maybe even uh, being deployed into production. And those steps usually are run my unit test suite, run my integration test suite, run my uh, you know, functional suite of whatever sort, run my smoke suite, however you want it. Um, the one I kind of want to call out here the most is, uh, is Travis CI. Uh, Travis CI is, uh, is amazing. It's, it's free on the internet. And basically, you can build, uh, you, can, you, you have free uh, kind of software as a service uh, CI um, from Travis CI. Those guys are, are really cool. Uh, and that, that, most, that works very, very well with, uh, with GitHub accounts and very and personal, account, personal um, projects. Um, so it's kind of advocating that we also take uh, open source uh, personal projects as seriously as we would any other project uh, and get in the CI game as well. I think that's, that's pretty cool. All right. Um, this song is uh, Parallel by Bad Religion. Um, these guys are punk rock to the core, okay? They repeat, our lives are parallel, our lives are parallel, our lives are parallel, as much as they absolutely need to so that you know that our lives are parallel. Um, and that's, that's the entire chorus of that song. These guys are awesome. I think the, the cool thing about these guys is they're completely repetitive, and almost every song sounds the same, and I still freaking love it. I mean, I, whatever, right? Um, uh, but but the, there's, a, there's an awesome kind of political message to this band. If you, uh, if you guys are interested, we can talk more about music and talk more about bad religion later. Um, but the, the concept here is, uh, is talking about not only parallelizing the execution on CI, but, but what about if we, if we parallelize the execution on our local box? Up until now, I've made an assumption, but I, I've assumed we're running these all, the, all these things sequentially locally uh, before we commit, anytime we want feedback. Um, I don't know about you guys, but almost every machine these days has many, many cores. I think this one's got something like eight ridiculous cores. Um, and uh, more often than not, we're just utilizing one of them. Um, and so uh, a whole bunch of uh, testing tools have come out these days to, to help you out with this problem. Um, we can talk about at least one of them. Um, yeah, everybody loves punk rock. Let's talk about some code. So, um, uh, so somebody said uh, that I'm you're awesome if, you're, if you do live demos. So let's try it. Um, cool. So uh, let me start by uh, saying that I, I made a sort of fictitious uh, kind of Ruby code base for you guys. It's, a, it's actually a, a fake Rails project just to, to prove out the deal. Um, here's the code. Uh, very basic. Uh, it's got nearly nothing in it except for one, uh, one model. That model is called item. Um, it's got a name and a quantity, nothing much. Uh, and I wrote eight tests for it, eight specs for it. So those specs all look the same, but they, they're fairly simple. All it does is it runs a test 10 times that ignorantly uh, puts things into the database and matches uh, and makes sure that they're there. They're so yeah, that's all that, well, that's all it does. Uh, so it does an item create, name doesn't matter, quantity's one, whatever. Uh, and then sleep for a random amount of time between zero and one seconds. Uh, and then let's just go ahead and check the database, make sure the count's one, right? Simple as that. By the way, um, because I'm lazy, so is items one spec, item two spec, I, I can't even tell the difference. They're all the same. So it's just, it's just eight test files. Um, I would say on average you're going to have uh, a test file per uh, additional other file that it matches to. Maybe it's a, uh, it's a model, maybe it's controller, maybe it's whatever. Uh, you guys pick. Um, but they're going to line like that. And because I wasn't particularly willing to, uh, to sit here and, and wait and watch it. This, the last run of it took 48 seconds. Um, and there's 80 tests there. Uh, they, it could run anywhere from, uh, I don't know, really, really something like 45 seconds-ish to about a minute and a half. That's what I've seen um, around that area. So I think uh, uh, the person that putting that even at a series of 80 tests, which is fairly low, 
um, we can, we, if they took us uh, anywhere between uh, zero and a second, then this is going to get out of hand very, very fast. Uh, if everyone agrees. So, um, I'm going to demonstrate a tool that exists in uh, in the Ruby world, uh, especially for RSpec. Uh, this is very pointed, but I think the uh, the demonstration uh, is is about the concept, not about the tool. Um, there are tools in almost every other language. The one I'm going to show you today is called Parallel Spec, um, but the but for Python you can use Nose, which I'll actually demo here in a minute, uh, and for uh, uh, for Java, you can use test and G. I think there's some support in there, things like that. But the, but the goal for us is to, is to sort of abuse the fact that I have a course on this thing and not just kind of live around with this uh, statically. And, I want, and, I, and I, what I really want you to see is how simple this is. Um, first things first is I installed the gem. That's the standard Ruby way of getting this done. And then um, I ran two commands. Uh, I ran rake, uh, parallel, create. And all that's going to do is run is is create my database, right? It's simple as that. Make sure the scheme is up to date. And in our, in the case that I'm going to show you, we're using an in-memory database anyways. You're going to use SQLite, so who cares? Uh, this is actually not that big a deal. Um, second step is going to go do uh, parallel prepare. I've already done these two things, so uh, it's not uh, it's not important that we run them now. Um, that's going to go ahead and run any any migrations, take care of uh, making sure your database is uh, completely up to snuff. Uh, and, and ready to rock. You're going to run that one uh, over and over and over again, uh, assuming that you have uh, a database migration structure where people are always continually upgrading your database. I assume that's how everyone rolls. Um, and then uh, to run your specs, instead of doing it the old fashioned way, I'm going to run parallel spec. Um, now, what this is going to do is first things first, it's going to check on my machine and it's going to find out how many cores I have. Uh, I, I think parallel spec is one of the more advanced ones where it goes ahead and takes care of that for you. You can specify how many cores you'd like, um, but it recognizes that mine's got eight and carries on, so on and so forth. Um, and so, oh, 14 seconds. I mean, it's, that's a phenomenal difference, right? I mean, I, I, like I said, I wasn't willing to, to wait the time to do the other one, and this one I don't mind doing in front of you. Um, you'll notice that it kind of barfs out pit a uh, up it a little bit, um, and that's because uh, at this stage, we, we figure um, you're probably mature enough to, to figure this all out. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, different threads writing uh, all to the same terminal all at once, and so you sometimes get these uh, brace 32Ms, and that's just because it's trying to do coloring and simple stuff like that. But um, but the output was pretty amazingly fast, um, and did all, my, all, all eight of my cores. Uh, so like I said, um, this one's parallel spec. Uh, there's, there's plenty of more. Um, that you guys can use. Uh, one thing uh, to note is uh, is you notice that what my tests were doing, the my tests, like I said, uh, are sleeping after they've done a create and then doing a count. Um, so the likely problem here is obviously that uh, if you were doing that on a shared database, uh, you're going to have troubles, right? Not your count's not going to be one because some other process is in the middle of uh, of doing its its work as well, and so. Uh, Almost every single testing tool has a, has a parallelizing of testing tool has uh, attacked this problem in some unique way. Uh, this one uh, I, I think is particularly elegant. And uh, what they do is they give you uh, they give you a f uh, parameter for you to use anywhere that you'd like. Um, so standard uh, standard uh, Rails stuff in the uh, in the database YAML. I, I've gone ahead and added this environment parameter that I can embed inside of the configuration. So I say, actually for testing, when you're going to go ahead and pull up test databases, fill in an environment number that's unique to each, uh, each thread that's going to run. So this one, uh, not only did it, uh, when I did the, uh, the parallel create, it didn't just create a, a single database, it actually created eight. Um, so if you look here in my database directory where I have all of the uh, all the actual databases, uh, there's, there's my databases. They're there. Uh, so test, test two, so on and so forth. Um, so that did the create, and then it also parallelized out the, the migrations onto those eight uh, databases as well. This, the, the reason I find this elegant is because they didn't take a shortcut and a kind of short-term uh, solution. Any shared infrastructure that you guys have, um, you guys can, you can utilize this. So if it's, if it's shared uh, memcache instance or something like that, that you're, you're, uh, all your tests are going to be using, you can go ahead and parallelize out the same way. 
um, and they make it fairly easy to hook into the uh, creates and the prepares to, to add on any kind of bootstrapping that you guys need to make sure that those instances of shared infrastructure um, uh, work properly. So I think that's, that's particularly elegant. Um, we'll see a little, uh, well, I won't go into enough, enough detail, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll see how uh, the Python world takes care of that um, here, in a, here in a quick second. But um, I don't know. I feel like that, that sort of proved its point. Uh, this thing happened in uh, 14 seconds as opposed to 48. Um, there's a little bit of randomness in there, but trust me, there's no way you can get that to run in 14 seconds uh, if you're doing it sequentially. It's just not possible. I can hear you guys saying, get back to the mixtape. We love the tunes. OK, let's do that. Uh, the next song uh, is called The Grit. Um, it's, uh, it's by Daft Punk. I like this song mostly because it's kind of ambient, and, uh, and uh, Daft Punk is not exactly known for this type of music. Uh, you guys probably heard these guys, uh, electronic mu uh, music uh, folks, to a pair. And they, they did the entire soundtrack for Tron Legacy, which I thought was an excellent movie. Um, I think the critics disagreed. Uh, can't win them all. No, I actually, quick aside, I actually liked the first Tron movie quite a lot. I thought that was, a, that, that was an awesome statement about that. I was at the 70s or 80s and how they looked at computers. Very cool. Um, so anyways, the, the point of the, of the grid uh, and the, uh, the Daft Punk aside um, is, uh, is a concept call, uh, called Selenium Grid. Selenium Grid, it, it just takes that parallelization concept. Oh yeah, love the, love the Tron stuff. Let's do another demo. Uh, takes, the, takes this whole um, uh, parallelization concept and it, uh, it takes it just one step further, okay? Um, so again, Selenium uh, is the tool that we're gonna use to, uh, to automate the actual click-through of the, of the application. Um, I don't know of anything particular that works for water in this case or some of the other tools, um, but uh, screw it, I'll show you the Selenium grid anyways. Um, so normally when we, when we run Selenium, uh, we're going to start up a, a server, uh, and, we're gonna, and then we're going to hit it with some tests. We're just going to point our tests at it, and we're going to go away. Uh, and it's going to run them in, in sequence. Um, when we start up Selenium Grid, we're going to start it up a little bit differently. Uh, what, first off, we're going to start up one instance, one process, uh, as the role of the hub. Okay? Um, I'll go ahead and start that up. And so this is the thing that is just the coordinator, the basic coordinator uh, that's taking care of things at the end of the day. Um, cool, that looks happy days. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and start up uh, something as a, as a node or a remote control. Uh, this, is a, this is a thing that's actually going to execute my tests. This, uh, this particular uh, node does not have to be on the same machine. You can spread this out easily across any machine you want because, as you can see here, all I'm doing is pointing uh, it to a particular hub that could live anywhere. Very, very easy to configure. Uh, and kind of the whole point of this, uh, this discussion is look how easy this is. If you're not doing this, I'm surprised. Um, I hope the rest of this goes well. Um, show you the code I've got in the back. Um, I made a sort of fake little quick uh, Python test here for you. Um, that test uh, is something like this. All I'm doing, uh, for those of you guys who, don't, who haven't used Selenium before, very basic. I'm setting up a, uh, a, a remote web driver um, with a certain set of capabilities. These capabilities are very important. I'm going to talk about those later. But um, the platform is, is the Mac. And the browser is going to be Firefox. Uh, by the way, Firefox is Selenium standard kind of thing. But you can use all, all sorts of different stuff. I've got two tests here. Uh, I've got one that tests that Google is still available. Um, very useful test. And then directly after that, uh, I've got a similarly useful test uh, to test that ThoughtWorks.com is available. Actually, I'd say that one's significantly more useful. Um, and and uh, that's it. This is, this is the core of it. All we're doing is doing a get, uh, hitting a URL, verifying a title, simple, easy peasy stuff. Um, cool. So uh, now I've got, in this process, I've got, uh, my, uh, I've got my output for my hub. I've got a remote control here. And I think it's useful to go check out this web page. Oh, yeah, it works. Um, uh, so this is, a, this is a little bit of a, a sort of dashboard that they provide you out of the box. Very, very easy to extend. Um, but all it's saying is, uh, here, I'm your hub. Uh, I'm on localhost uh, port 4,444. And I have one uh, remote proxy uh, available for work. And it supports up to five concurrent tests on all of these browsers. That's without me doing anything. I literally took pretty much the example out of the box, and I, and I just booted it up for you to demo something. 
And so it's got a whole bunch of different versions. Of, these are multiple different versions of Firefox, multiple different versions of Chrome, a couple of different versions of IE, things like that. Um, and cool. And so I, it, it knows that I'm on a Mac and everything. It's all happy days. So um, let's see, what do I have here? So if I just ran that, that's not the file. Sorry. Yeah, test the internet. Let's do that. Work. Um, so that's going to go ahead and hit the uh, the back end there. There it goes. Pops up an instance of Firefox. Um, and we'll wait just a quick second while it goes ahead and validates Google if I have the internet. Ooh, that's why they said not to do live demos. Um, cool. So all, all that's going to do is pop up an instance of Firefox. Uh, go check the uh, the instant the the check Google and go on from there. I'm going to kill it since I am getting signals that I should stop. Uh, cool, killed. Um, and then the the awesome thing is uh, it's going to ruin my demo because I don't have the um, I don't I don't have the internet. But um, all I got to do is uh, is employ a, a small little bit of uh, of additional stuff on the end of that. Um, Add, use a, a tool called Nose in, in Python. Uh, this is just a, a basic, I'm, I'm really just using it for its test runner capabilities. And then I'm telling it to, to parallelize uh, across two processes because I only have two tests. And uh, let's see if I can make that rock and roll. Uh, see, it, pr it produced two, uh, two browsers very quickly. Hey, ThoughtWorks is up. <laughs> Suck it, Google. Um, quickly, and then uh, what I want you to notice is that since I killed that other one, uh, it shows that three of the Firefox instances are now not unavailable from that remote control. So uh, uh, the, the dashboard's kind of nice. It shows you what's the, what things are currently in use. Very, very useful. Um, and we'll carry on from there. Um, but point here is, is first off, Selenium, not scary. Um, Selenium, very, very easy to understand. Uh, and the test, very, very simple to write. Even if you're writing kind of crude tests, uh, very, very easy to do. Um, there's no reason not to. Uh, there's absolutely no reason not to. Um, and then uh, parallelizing out across uh, many, many different boxes, very easy with Selenium Grid. Uh, the hub is taking care of all that business, figuring out what, uh, what nodes have the appropriate capabilities that are necessary to, that you asked for to run this test. Very easy. Uh, again, if you had a suite of Selenium tests, for you to run those across multiple browsers. So say you had a, a series of, of, of Selenium tests, and, and your, uh, the guy from the business comes up and says, hey, uh, Patrick, we need to support um, IE now. Um, so I go, crap. Uh, and so all, all I got to do is spin up a, a, a Windows box. Um, and so I spin up my Windows box, uh, and I get my, my, my node. Uh, it's, it's there, and, it, and it's going to point to the hub. And just, it just registers itself and says, hey, I got, I got IE. Uh, let me have it. And then all you have to do is, is uh, run your tests twice uh, in, and push it out to those two different boxes. You're off to the races. Really, it's, it's a piece of cake. Uh, this is not the, not the most difficult things uh, smart programmers like yourselves have ever done. Cool. Um, back to the, the songs. Um, the next one. Uh, it's all fun, fun, fun. It's kind of the end of it. Um, so, side B is—is uh, is any questions? Anything you guys want to talk about? I know you guys are probably ready to go get drinks, and I'm not going to have hurt feelings if you're just like. Uh, they can ask questions as long as they want because it's—it's. It's yeah, <laughs> I can keep you here. Sorry, I, I just missed the name of the Java tool that you use for parallel testing. Yeah, TestNG has support for that. Um, TestNG. TestNG. Uh, it's NG. kind of a spin-off uh, that's been around for a couple of years. Uh, don't quote me. It's been a long time since I've done Java professional. They want beer. So do I. Oh. All right, you can catch Patrick at Paris. If you have questions, cool. Thank you very much.